So look, hi everyone and welcome to a joint spree and seam seminar. Uh, we are very lucky to have Eric here, who works with a group called Energy Transition, which is basically... Energy Innovation. Innovation, my apologies. Uh, transition's been taken, I guess. Mm -hmm. I but uh, based out of California mainly. Uh, they work across a range of issues, but uh, electricity markets is a big part of it. We met at a workshop in Colorado a couple of years mm -hmm. ago on this question. There was a lot of interest in the uh, Australian approach of the national electricity market around market design for renewables and, and so on. And Eric's now actually visiting uh, Australia for a year, so there's going to be plenty of opportunities if you want to chase things up or get more perspectives on the US. The US, of course, is a complex place for thinking about electricity markets because they have just about every arrangement uh, possible somewhere. 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 And obviously resource adequacy is a big topic here in Australia as well uh, right now. Our electricity industry restructuring, introduction to the electricity market, we had a huge overhang of generation, very large reserve margins, resource adequacy, enough generation to meet expected demand wasn't really seen as an issue, but we've had some demand growth, not as much as many expected, uh, but increasingly seeing retirements and uh, growing problems with thermal plants. So resource adequacy is a big issue here. It's a bit hard to wrap your head around the language of reliability and security. It's, uh, it all gets a bit messy. Um, but lots to learn from the US and elsewhere about approaches. If you're following the Australian debate, you'll know we have a retailer reliability obligation, which is kind of enforced now. There's a sort of gateway, there's a trigger by which it actually triggers. We haven't seen exactly how it's gonna unfold yet. The federal government has its, I think, is it UNGI or UNGI? Uh, effectively underwriting new generation investment through federal, uh, effectively, uh, financial support uh, with a focus on what they're calling dispatchable generation. So anyway, for a whole range of reasons, it's a great time to be thinking about what lessons we can see from resource adequacy uh, elsewhere. And so uh, Eric's probably going to speak for about 40 minutes or so. We're determined mm -hmm. to leave time for questions. Are you happy to take questions of clarification yeah. as you go? So if something just... I'm happy to sense. tell people to shut up if I want to keep moving, don't worry. You can do that as well. You can do that. Oh, I can take turns. Um, okay, so please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to be able to present for you guys. Uh, and this has been a great opportunity for me to kind of step back and think about some of the things I've been thinking about in a more holistic context. So the title of my talk involves the blind man and the elephant. Uh, this is a story that's oft told. Um, this is even a, a poem. Apparently this is based on an Indian uh, mythology or fable. But the idea is you have all these blind men and they are touching different parts this is blind men and not blind women. Blind women would talk to each other. Um, so the blind men are touching different parts of the elephant. And um, you know, one's convinced it's, he's touching a wall. One thinks it's a rope. One thinks it's a tree, fan, and so on. You can read that. But the basic idea is none of them are getting the full picture. And resource adequacy is a bit like this elephant. It's traditionally, people think of it as this one thing. Uh, but it really has all these elements to it. And if you don't understand the elements, you're not really understanding the whole. You're just measuring the rope or measuring the fan or measuring the wall. So I'm going to try to kind of explain how that works out. And at the same time, uh, give you kind of an overview of how things are in the US, kind of where things are placed, um, and so on. But before I kind of tell you where the markets are, I just want to go over what I think of as the two basic functions of an independent system operator. Of course, you know, you ask five experts, you'll get 10 definitions. But uh, it, th the key part is the real-time security constrained economic dispatch. You know, it's just telling who to be on, who's going to be on at any given interval. And then managing the high voltage system. So you've, you've turned over, the, usually you turn over the transmission system um, to the system operator. And you'll, you'll, you'll see later on there's an example with California where uh, we have this thing called an energy imbalance market, which is not a full ISO um, that California is a part of. And, and the, the key elements here are that the ISO has to operate both under normal and emergency conditions. And so they tend to think about lines going down or generators going down, contingencies. And 
they're not guaranteed to have the resources they need. They, they don't control what gets bought, what gets invested, and so on. They kind of have to play with the tools that are given to them. And that creates kind of a tension. They feel like they have responsibility for delivering a, serv a service, a system that works, but they don't have all the inputs under their control. Now, th those two basic functions um, are usually supplemented. So in the, in the SCED function, the, the scheduling function, uh, in the US, we see forward markets of day ahead, hour ahead, 15 minute markets. Uh, you guys don't have that here, which is kind of interesting. In the US, they serve two basic functions. One of them has to do with the resource commitment. So they're, they're like coal plants and so on. They need to be committed ahead of time. And so if you get a look in the day ahead market at what's going on, that goes into a commitment engine. Uh, but the other, the other real key factor is just managing risk and pricing risk. And this allows the consumers to be less exposed to the volatilities of the real-time market and allows the generators uh, to be less exposed to these, vol to these volatile things. And there's a transparency element uh, in that you can bring in these third-party traders. So, for example, in California, I'm going a little in the weeds here, but the, the far end of the supply curve is almost all virtual bids. Um, so it's very powerful in kind of giving you information where the market is going. Uh, so unit commitment, I talked about faster settlement. You guys just did that. Nodal markets, you guys are thinking about doing that. Ancillary services, well, you know, you need fast black start and uh, managing voltage and all that stuff. It kind of comes hand in hand with transmission and, and operating the system. And then flexibility products is something start, we're starting to see more of um, to kind of help manage changes in the system. And also look ahead. Uh, so so that as the computers are getting more powerful and weather and things are kind of playing more of a role, the, you, you need to think about where the system's going to be uh, several intervals ahead of time in terms of positioning it in, in the current interval. And then on the transmission side, typically you're going to have some transmission planning that the ISO is going to do, interconnection studies and queue management are always part of it, and uh, financial transmission rights. Okay, they kind of come hand in hand. You guys will discover that. Uh, and then <clears throat> there's the big question of resource adequacy. So that wasn't one of those two things I told you about, but when everybody's going to scream at you when the system's not working and nobody really cares that much whether you make them pay a little bit more, um, you're going to worry a lot about making sure that you have the resources at hand. And so these system operators are really get kind of obsessive about the resource adequacy and, and, and their, the, the kind of counterparties uh, in the legislature and the regulators also worry about it. And so they get into things like capacity markets or fuel assurance payments, uh, flexibility payments, and uh, operational reserve demand curve, which I will not explain. Um, I'll get to some of these topics later. Okay, <clears throat> so about two-thirds of the load in the U.S. is served by these organized markets, okay? And um, oh yeah, I am supposed to use this pointer. So roughly speaking, we have a cluster over here, which we call the Northeast markets, these three. You have kind of the central markets, MISO and SPP. Some people think it's MISO. Nah, everybody says MISO. Um, ERCOT, which is an unusual one. So Texas has its own grid. It's not uh, on the same AC grid as the west or the east. Norm basically, the, there's a line down here. Everything east of that is eastern interconnection. Everything west is western. And then these guys are their own grid. And the reason is that they're really hardcore about their state's rights, and they didn't want to be subject to a lot of federal oversight. And then California has its own independent system operator, uh, which you'll see later is part of a bigger energy imbalance system. So just to give you some, I don't know if you can read these. Um, sorry about that. But you see, these are pretty big systems. All of these, uh, at least as big or bigger than Australia's NEM, and uh, quite a diversity of resources bringing capacity. In this last column here, I just wanted to highlight the fact that the approach to capacity procurement is varied as well. So you have ERCOT, which is more like you guys, energy only. Then you have these hybrid uh, arrangements in these three, and then the capacity markets in the last three. 
In some sense, what you were just talking about, Ian, is would kind of figure under the hybrid model, you know. Um, and but but these concepts I, are from the the reliability regulator NERC. That this is where the numbers are from. These are kind of old school concepts of capacity: peak, summer, capacity. Right? It's like how tall is your elephant? I don't care anything else about your elephant. Um, and uh, and the other thing that's different from Australia is even though we have these organized markets underlying, we don't necessarily have the separate retailers and networks. So in some states, like say Pennsylvania, it's separated like you guys, and in other states, like Minnesota or something, it's full vertical. Okay, so it's it's a full vertical utility, and then they turn over um, the dispatch of their units and their transmission system. And even there, they don't always turn it over. They, there's a lot of what's called self-dispatch, where they just say, we'll take whatever price. And that's kind of crazy, because often they, the, the consumers are paying a lot for that, because they're, they pay a fixed price for the power coming out of a power plant, and that's not being recovered in the market. So these resource adequacy approaches, how am I doing on time here? Um, so there's the hands-off, what you guys kind of have, kind of having, struggling with. That's Texas. In Texas is an interesting cultural case, and they're really into the free markets, and um, they're very conservative. And, but they seem to have stumbled on a winning formula, I think. Um, and it's not because I'm a hardcore markets person. It's just I think in the kind of environment we're going into, having more transparencies, more granular data, um, is makes is going to make things easier. But um, they so they they have no requirement um, to uh, to procure capacity. Then the opposite end is this idea of capacity markets. So there, in the early days, there was this worry that some big utilities kind of might have more access to, to resources than others, and they, so they created these kind of central markets, which would be kind of fair and transparent, and everyone would be, have access to them on an equal basis. And they've just been a mess. They're just constantly having to rejig these things, because there's kind of a central lack of logic to the capacity markets. And I could spend like a good hour explaining why I don't like capacity markets. Uh, I'll touch on it a little bit later. But the, the main issue is this kind of cyclicity. The capacity markets undermine the energy markets. The undermined energy markets kind of force the need for more capacity. And then capacity goes into a political realm. And so you get into these kind of political fights about what are better resources and so on. You're not really looking at solid kind of engineering criteria for what to value, and that creates all kinds of distortions, problems, um, and, and it's been a real mess. Uh, and also, by the way, if you look back here, you'll notice Texas has a 8.5% planning margin last summer, and everybody else is way up there. So, and that's, that's, a, that's big money. If Texas was keeping these kinds of reserve margins, uh, over the last few years, it would probably cost them, you know, forty, fifty billion dollars. Then there's the hybrid approach. So the hybrid approach is, the states really want control over the resource mix, and so they they decide what gets built, what doesn't get built, or they go to the retailers like you guys and say, well, you guys have to buy, you know, you have to buy X amount to to handle your capacity. Now, of course, this is, this, it's always an interplay with the regulator and the federal authorities. So there's some capacity criteria they have to meet. So if the state doesn't do a good enough job of making sure its utilities are meeting the criteria, then the ISO might make them take remedial offers. But it's, but it's a mix. It's the state trying to handle the resource adequacy part, not handing it over to the system operator. And that's working so-so. So what is the resource adequacy elephant? Well, 
you know, at, at first, it's a deceptively simple idea. You just want to make sure that the system operator, every time that they're running the system, every five minutes or 15 minutes or hour or so on, has what they need to make sure the system doesn't break down or black out. You know, just do they have the tools that they need? And of course, you know, uh, there's some people would like to have an infinite tool shed, right? I mean, you can't give them an infinite number of tools, and so there's some criteria for deciding just how many tools we want to give them. And that has to do with what you've decided is the reliability criteria. There's this kind of one in 10 year criteria that kind of drifted out of nowhere, maybe around World War II, somebody's paper. It's very strange to track down these things. It doesn't have a lot of analytical grounding. Um, it's also, it's a transmission system level criteria. And most people experience outages because of the distribution system. Maybe two or 300 times more often or more hours or more minutes or whatever than from a transmission level event. So it's also kind of in the noise uh, of everything else. It is a strange criteria, but it's been hard to dislodge. And um, sort, of course, once people are starting to put backup systems or have DERs and so on, it's going to be even more difficult to decide kind of what's an acceptable level of reliability. But traditionally, this, this resource adequacy has been about planning for peak, kind of the height of the elephant, as it were, you know, one, one dimension of the story, and then contingencies, you know, n minus one, n minus one, minus one, basically, if this line goes down, do we have enough, and so on. And that fixes um, some of the planning criteria and also the kind of reserves that are being held. But today and in the future, risk evaluations can be much more complex and, and it has to be more holistic. That, it's not all bad, I think, we used these kind of crude tools before. We probably paid a lot of extra money for them. The fact that this, the underlying system dynamics is changing in ways that force us to take another approach is also probably an opportunity to have a more efficient and maybe even more resilient system. But in this old way of looking at the power system, you basically had this base load, intermediate, and peak, and you know, if you wanted to assign a kind of poster child, this base load was nuclear and coal, intermediate was uh, combined cycle gas, and peak was like a um, oil or, or combustion turbine. Uh, my understanding is actually in England, intermediate and base load were kind of reversed. They had base load gas and intermediated coal, which is kind of strange. But so you see this kind of stack here when you look at the lo the um, load duration curve. Um, and this really assumes this kind of dispatchable model, right? That these, these things are always available to be used when you need them, which is not true, um, as you've learned here in Australia. But close enough. And, you know, you saw some variation during the day and some variation with season, but you're not seeing a lot of change. And so, Aiming for this idea of meeting the peak kind of covered most of your bases. So that's kind of like the old school way. It worked well enough, though probably had embedded in it a lot of rents for generators. But there's challenges to this picture. Sorry about the picture there. I saw it today. It's just amazing. Um, <laughs> you have in the U.S., we have cheap natural gas that's changing unit economics. It's been a big shakeup. We have very cheap solar and wind. Um, I'm not sure people appreciate just how cheap these things have gotten. Um, we, we have some level of federal subsidies for wind and solar. Um, but even unsub the unsubsidized price is probably getting into the $30, $35 a megawatt hour. In a, in a large swaths of the country, in, in large parts of the country, which in, in Australian would be twenty twenty five dollars a megawatt hour. Uh, oh, right, right. Uh, so forty forty five Australian or something like that. Um, then we have battery storage making an appearance, and demand side resources. So we're looking at something like this. 
This is uh, an old study now looking at kind of a bad week for 33% wind and solar in, in the western U.S. And they were looking at how much would the fossil stuff down here have to cycle. That's, so first the mindset is you're kind of marginal, you're new, you're new to the game. Now, oh, you're really pushing us around. That's that light blue is the wind and it's going to cost and maybe we need to figure out how much to charge you for how much we're going to cost. And then you get to this. Um, these are kind of confidential results. Um, so I'm just using them in an illustrative way and I won't tell you who did this modeling. But just to give you a sense, uh, this person was telling me that we could have for close to the same price as the existing system in California, 90% clean by 2030. And then he had modeled some of the kind of challenging weeks. And so in this one here, you can see you have a lot of gas burn and then not. This red stuff up here is a lot of curtailment. You see the storage behaving here. Lots of ramping. You can see it's a huge different mix of resources coming in and out. Okay. And what's happening on this day is very different than this day. This day, very different from the next. So if you've got this simple one-dimensional model of the elephant, how ready are you for this? Okay. And this models out as feasible, as, as cost-effective. It's just a question of having the right structures, the right incentives, and so on to, to make it happen. And it's fairly clear that the resource adequacy frameworks that we have today are not ready for this. And we have resources that come in many flavors, and they have associated downsides from the point of view of um, resource adequacy, and some flavor overlap. So I don't know. I guess I don't want to go through all of these uh, one by one. You guys can kind of read the screen, but I just want to maybe highlight a few of them. Okay, the dispatchable fuel okay, is not the panacea that some in that industry like to talk about. And one big issue um, is outages. So especially peakers and things like that, they, they can run for one hot day, maybe a second hot day, and the third day comes along and they just can't make it. Or some of your old coal units here, they have these big boilers and after a while they have to go in there and scrub out the ash and crap that's in the bottom of it. Um, there's maintenance and often the maintenance is scheduled for the shoulder seasons, the fall and the spring in the U.S., but lately the fall and the spring has been more complicated. Sometimes a lot of wind, less solar, uh, the weather, weather changes a lot. Um, and so this availability issue and, and outage management has become more and more of an issue. Okay, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be like blue team, red team here. I'm just saying every resource comes with limitations. And in the Northeast, um, fuel availability constraints have been an issue. Now, the wind and solar, ocean stuff, well, it's, it's variable. Uh, people are concerned about how it's going to change the way markets work because of the zero marginal costs. Uh, I'm not that concerned about it, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about that if they want to. It's a really interesting subject. But they do have transmission congestion issues. You've see, you guys have seen your MLFs moving around. I mean, this stuff usually is not built right next door, so um, that's part of the story. There is, there is some clean baseload energy, like geothermal in the U.S., but it's typically limited in the areas where it can happen. Energy efficiency is also a, a, a huge resource. Uh, my sense is you guys are kind of terrible in energy efficiency. Uh, the house where I am leaks like a sieve, and uh, one of my nephews is like an engineer. And he says he wouldn't buy a new house in Sydney. It's so much worse than the old ones. Um, that's, really a, that's really criminal. You guys really should get on with that because... That's a really important uh, low-lying low fruit somehow is being missed here. Uh, then we have the energy-limited resources. So that's batteries, hydro to some extent, because the water is there or not, and demand response. You say, why is demand response energy-limited? Well, a lot of people, they're happy for you to you know, clip their demand 10 times in a year, but not 20 or 30. And th that segment is going to be very important in markets because they don't price themselves in the market based on their marginal cost of production. They price themselves based on when they think they're going to make the most money. So they have a kind of mercantile approach that we've typically wanted to avoid in the markets and we see as anti-competitive. 
But that's, that's how storage and things like that are going to have to work. And as these resources become more important on the margin or just more there, uh, market monitoring, making sure you have enough competition is going to become really important. And then there's distributed energy resources, which you guys are all familiar with here in, in Australia. You guys are really at the forefront of that. They kind of overlap with all these other things, except they don't have the transmission issues. Uh, they're also interesting because the capital commitment is coming from different place. The nice thing is that they introduce more competition. And really, the best way to make markets work is to have more competitions. So it's, it's, it's a simple thing to say, but it, it's, it's a deep truth about markets. So given all these players, what are the parts of the, of the elephant? How, how should I think about RA if I'm not thinking about just meeting peak? Well, obviously, a really important part of resource adequacy or thinking about policy for resource adequacy is, is the investment retirement cycle. It takes a long time to build a power plant, even longer to build a transmission line. And things don't always retire that quickly because you think maybe if you hold on for a year or two, maybe you'll make money. And people can cluster their investment or retirement decisions all at once. So suddenly, you know, you were fine on resources and then suddenly in the next year you have a lot less. Resource availability is an important part of the story. So are there going to be outages? Is the energy variable? Um, or is it energy limited? Okay. You have to think about that resource availability dimension. Even in, in small technical details, it can be quite important. So for example, in California, with this idea of flexible resource adequacy, the units that were supposed to be allow us to meet ramp, what we were finding is that they weren't doing that job because often they weren't committed in the day ahead. Resource flexibility, kind of related to that. Um, so it, it's interesting. I, I've had some engineers tell me, well, once, once we get rid of like the slow start coal or these block start things, well, we won't need day ahead markets anymore because we don't need unit commitment. Uh, and wouldn't that be great? So. It would be great not to have unit commitment. It's important to understand that the unit commitment part of the story uh, it is, you know, it is a mole, uh, a small defect on the, st uh, on the market design that you can't quite avoid today. And, um, and, and, and it's good to point to it so that you policymakers can understand that every resource brings different advantages and disadvantages. I still think you're going to need the day ahead and you know, week ahead or things like that uh, for the volatility management. Uh, which brings me to risk management. Well, diversity is good. And some uh, resource availability are more correlated. What am I saying there? Right. So in this old mindset, we had this N minus 1. Like, well, that plant there might not be available because that line will go out. But what if it's your whole pipeline network that's stressed? Like you have a big winter in the Northeast, everybody's using the gas to, to warm up their houses, and there's just not enough available for all the gas plants. And now you have a whole bunch of gas plants not available. Or it gets really cold and your coal piles freeze, and you have, that's not happening in Australia, but it does happen in the US. It gets really cold in the north middle part of the US. Uh, you don't have nuclear here either, but uh, in France we've seen a whole bunch of nuclear units go out all at the same time because the water was too, temperature was too high for the intake. So there, there are, and then in California we had fires. You guys will probably get big fires too, or you definitely had some. And and, and the fire can create a, a challenge for the whole system all at once. So this risk management picture is really important. And finally, there's the platform needs. Um, you can't really have an adequate system if the power can't get from one place to another. And if the market's not there to ensure that the investment happens um, or that the investment happens in the right places, or you can say, well, is this really resource adequacy? This is all about dollars and cents, Eric. What are you, and are you kind of mixing things? Well, let, give, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, we had the first crisis in California in 2001 where we had all these power shortages and power spikes 
you know, initially started because they had a low hydro year in the Northwest that's a trading partner for California. So we weren't getting a lot of power from them that we usually counted on. And suddenly all these gas units had to run a lot more. And because they were running a lot more, they were having outages, right? Uh, that's part of what I was talking about before, resource availability. But then the smart people at Enron were like, hey, hang on, when these outages happen, we make a lot of money. Maybe, maybe they could happen slightly more often. You know, maybe we could call up some people and say, yeah, maybe don't bring it back quite so yet. And so, you know, the market power you know, starts having a physical effect on the system. So the, 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 you can never really decouple the economic incentives and the kind of engineering dimension of making sure that you have a system that works. The problem is the system operators, they are at heart kind of engineer, mathemat mathematician minded. They don't really like getting into that market power dimension. And for anybody who's interested in market power, what's happening here is just horrifying. I mean, most of our, our market systems, even outside the organized markets, have kind of fail-safe systems in the US and the, with various criteria, three pivot suppliers or whatever. And it seems to me that on any given day in Australia, you'd be triggering our fail-safe. So you basically imagine the US has like a fuse board. Over here, the fuse board would be lighting up all the time. Um, that might be useful to go through some examples. But before I get into examples, are, were, were there any questions anybody wanted to ask about the material so far? Might just make a comment that we do have folks here uh, looking at some of these market power issues, uh, given the challenges we are seeing, as you say. Yeah. And uh, they do pivot analysis and so on, but in a fairly ad hoc kind of annual reporting way rather than in a material uh, real-time monitoring way. Right, and, and that's pretty interesting stuff. I, mean, I don't know a lot about it, but like for example, California runs, has like these separate runs all the time, uh, alternate runs of their SCAD system that are looking at this market power stuff. Um, you know, my feeling is you're, you're always going to be chasing the smart financier types if you think you can kind of stay ahead of them. And uh, I saw a paper about um, the interaction pe between people who were trading financial transmission rights and LMP uh, stuff in MISO and, and, and got caught up in some enforcement actions because they were manipulating things. Um, there was a rule change and these economists, they love what they called natural experiments, kind of like the before and after. And they found that there's actually I can't remember which way the change went, but the, the gist of the idea was with one rule there were a lot more participants than with the other rule. And though, even though the, the rule with more participants seemed to have more possibilities for market power, the fact that there was more participants really kept that down. And, uh, so I think from a policy point of view, my recognition is, to, is, is find ways to introduce competition. Um, would be it. If, if you can't get it from the generators, then from the demand side. So PJM. Uh, not my favorite right now. Uh, look at this, this graph here. That's the one going down, that's their energy only market revenues. The one going up, that's their capacity market revenues. Uh, that's not a good situation because that's being run on economics, on algorithmics. It's giving the risks to the generators. This is guaranteeing money to the people who have the loudest voices. Um, and right now, they don't even have an authorized tariff for this capacity market. They couldn't get something past the regulator. Um, and, and it's become a way to pay off long-term costs of, of power plants and not to deal with, with the, the security issues. There's also a huge conflict with state policies. So some states want to do green and stuff like that, and then they have their system operator trying to like, work against them. Uh, and so you know, powerful states like Illinois are saying, oh, well, we're just going to pull out. Not pull out of the market, but pull out of the capacity, the whole capacity mechanism which is not a great outcome for the, for the ISO. And they used to be very tech forward, this, this outfit. You know, they brought in some of the first battery systems and so on, and now they're mired in controversy. So letting the incumbents decide, sometimes this kind of seems politically easy, but just you're really kicking the ball down the line and it's gonna make life worse for you later on. New England, they have similar issues to PJM because of the capacity markets and the so-called Mopar rules, but they don't have the coal, they're retiring their nuclear, the wind transmission build-out has been slow, so they've been 
basically retire, relying on their gas more, and they're at the way end of the pipelines for the U.S. So if there's a big winter, they're the ones that kind of get it last, and so they're really worried about that. So they're trying to create these rules to do energy assurance and so on, and that's the problem once you let the kind of geeks in their outfit take over is they, they want to create a proliferation of products and things, and they're not always thinking about the overlap. Um, they also have high capacity prices. One year, a couple years ago, the zone around, Massachusetts, around Massachusetts there, around Boston, was paying the equivalent of paying $10,000 a megawatt hour for 20 hours straight. When I say that to American audiences, they're, they're like, I think that's awful. I guess for you guys, it's <laughs> an average bad season. But, um, but they've had some tech progress, and especially some really nice pilots with uh, aggregated batteries um, that, uh, that got reported um, at a eSig meeting that I was at. Uh, I recommend the eSig materials. They, they really collect a lot of really interesting stuff. They had also somebody from Germany at the time. And Germ what the Germans are doing with aggregated batteries is really fascinating, too. And they typically have a, a, a layer of, uh, they have more batteries than they're actually getting credit for, so they can swap them out. So they, they, their, the availability for that capacity is really amazing. And then uh, Texas. This is an LMP map. Uh, why don't I show you this LMP map? This is actually a pretty ordinary day. Um, going from minus 20 to, to 30. Uh, notice the southeast there, you've got some the hot, hot zone and a cold zone right next to each other that really screams a need for transmission, but that's not happening. So they did do a good job building out transmission links kind of in, from over here to over here in this kind of zone. And uh, I think that would be a good model for Australia, this idea of renewable energy zones. They're thinking about doing some to over here to, to get to the oil and gas. and. Uh, the guys I know at the system operator are kind of excited about the idea that they could politically convince people to build the lines to serve the oil and gas, but then uh, when that boom goes away, they'll have the lines to bring the solar back from the west. Um, they have, and they have a really nice balance between the coastal wind down here, the inland wind down here, and the solar. They, between the three of them, they tend to actually give a pretty good mix of uh, resources that fits load. But it's an islanded system, like you guys. So they, they have a few interconnectors, uh, AC, DC, AC, one director. They actually have, it's kind of funny, they have some power plants that sit right on the boundary between Texas and the Eastern Interconnect. And they can change their switchyard so that they either feed into that interconnection or that interconnection. Uh, which is really only interesting to people who are like putting together the Excel spreadsheets like I am and like trying to figure out, like, well, where is this plant supposed to be? The outliers are always annoying. Uh, for data and, and, uh, and analysis, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and then, uh, well, the big story here was their PRM was really low, the, the, the planning reserve margin, 8.5%. And they had some hot days, um, and uh, their reserves drop below 2,000 megawatts, and uh, they called some kind of like first level emergency, which is like, when you make radio ads for people to lower their consumption and kick in some, some load control units and so on. But they didn't, they didn't have any blackouts. Um, and uh, they got some high prices and uh, the generators are happy and some people will be building more. Uh, that's kind of how it's supposed to work. Um, so in fact, even though people were kind of calling this the kind of Armageddon scenario, the, the summer's proven out the model of the energy only market. Uh, let's see what happens if there's several summers like this, but I don't think that's what's going to happen because now there's an investment signal. So I, I, I think for Australians, Texas have a lot of, especially has a lot of lessons to offer. Uh, their main way of trying to address resource adequacy is basically having an adder to the, to the price called the ORDC. And that's a way to basically give generators more money based on when the system's stressed. So there's a kind of time and location signal, not location, time signal, telling you when it's more or less valuable to be present on the system. Uh, and that's pretty interesting. It, it, it's a good contrast between planning and commercial activity in the sense that 
if you look at how they put together the spreadsheets for, for how much capacity they have for the summer, they have to look at all the plants and, and, they, and some of the old plants, they have to do what's called derating, right? They have to assume they're not going to be there some of the time. So they look at historical patterns and so on, and they come up with some percentage. And some of these old plants, they're derating them at like 50 or 60 percent. But then, because of the way these markets work, these old plants, they have a big incentive to show up on the hot days when the prices are going to be high, and they have been. Uh, and so that's a big difference. You know, if they, they were just paid to be capacity, they, didn't really have, they wouldn't really have to work their butts off to be there on those days. But when they have to be there on those days to get the money they need, then they know what, they know what to do. And finally, on uh, California. Uh, God, a lot of text here, sorry. Okay. Well, the picture first. So, picture, so what's interesting, what's happening here is California is becoming part of something called an energy imbalance system. It's a very balkanized system in the west of the U.S., and, and nobody wants to kind of turn over control. And so there's this kind of very tiptoey way of learning to work with each other. And this energy imbalance system is one of them. But it's immediately brought to the fore problems with just tr trading energy imbalances without turning over the transmission system or having a firm schedule. And so they're moving to day ahead commitments. They're thinking about transmission more. I think it's going to be one of these things where every Every time they try to fix something, they're going to find themselves more and more pushed into an ISO type situation. Uh, but it's, for, for, for scholars in the field, like, like you folks, it's really an interesting entity to study because it's changing, but it also has kind of part of the features of the in independent system operator and, and not other parts. Uh, you know, this one is the one that people, ah, I'm supposed to, sorry, red dot. This one is the one people always talk about, this damn duck curve. Um, I made it really small to give you a sense of how much I'm prioritizing it. Uh, you know, this is nothing that a bunch of batteries couldn't take care of. I mean, really, uh, the big problems with renewables integration is kind of long sets of days with no wind and solar or, um, you know, that I showed you earlier, right? There were some days where you had a lot of gas and so on. It's, it's not so much this intraday stuff. I mean, it's not trivial. You know, if, if you don't have the flexible ramping capabilities and so on, then, you know, you will get a blackout. But it's uh, not maybe the, the, the first thing people should focus on. It's, it's not even the first thing that's really happening on the system. What's really happening on the system is, is a big price dispersion uh, effect. If you look at kind of what's happening with prices on, in, in five-minute intervals, you get a, they're spreading out a lot more. Uh, and so the kind of batteries you want operating in California aren't four-hour batteries that are going to help you deal with that ramp. I mean, eventually you'll want to have some. But right now, between what we already have in terms of equipment and playing with our neighbors, we can handle it. It's actually dealing with that dispersion of, of prices. That's where the money is for batteries. And so that's, I think, an important effect. An important lesson with this market stuff is that because the, the system is changing so much, we don't have a lot of experience with this high renewables system. I don't really trust the planners to, to plan quickly enough and well enough to understand what are exactly the resources the system needs in a way that's going to be economically efficient. Like nobody thought that these one hour batteries running in five to 15 minute intervals were something the system needed, but the prices are pointing there. And, and, I, and not, I don't think these are not artifacts of some kind of manipulation. They're, they're, they're pointing to real challenges on the system. Um, and like I said, 90% doable. Uh, and I think you'll see California keep pushing. The big, big question mark right now is because of fires and public safety shutoffs. I don't know if everybody followed this, but we had a million customers basically last week that were shut off um, because of fire risk. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how the state struggles with that because the numbers are big. Okay, so you know, if you're going crit to criticize what's done the old way, okay, what do you have to offer? What do you? What's your deal, Eric? You know, what would you do? So, here are my, so here's some of my thoughts. First, we need to engage the demand side participation a lot more, especially dynamic pricing response. So, demand side is really a lot of different things. You know, on the one end of the spectrum, you have energy efficiency. It's kind of like a fixed 
reduction. And on the other hand, uh, you, you have um, something on the demand side that could mimic that fast battery to some extent. We had a, a really cool report in California on demand response that had these kind of four S's. Uh, can't always remember them. Four, shed, shimmy, shape, yeah, I can't remember the fourth one. Shift, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's, that's a pretty good way of thinking of kind of the spectrum of services. Um, in any case, from the point of view of market dynamics, the, the dynamic pricing response really will help set scarcity pricing and, and allow you to not use administrative mechanisms to, to get to scarcity pricing. It also allows you to be less worried about a blackout or some kind of you know, running off the cliff. Basically, what demand, what demand side participation, when, and when high prices are happening, is it kind of shaves off the edge of the cliff. You know, if, if, if you're almost out of resources, maybe there's somebody somewhere that's willing to back off on their demand if the money's good enough. And ultimately, the, the, demand is, the reason the supply is to be there is because the demand is there. If there's no demand, there's no need for supply. So, so the demand side is a really important part of the equation. Uh, I could get a lot more into that, but I won't. Um, nodal and granular energy only plus services and derivatives, probably the best option to handle changing technology mix and policy and investment environment. So that's kind of like a mouthful there, um, kind of covering my bases. But I think I talked about it already. I think if, if you're dealing with a situation, a system that you understand well, you know, maybe it's easy to figure out what are the bits and pieces you should have and how much they should be priced and so on. But the market environment to give you price signals. Now, not the, markets, the market environment all by itself, you, know, you need the enforcement, you need the, um, the bilateral and the multilateral trading, the hedging, all these other things have to kind of come with it. It's not, you know, a bad market can be a real problem too. Um, but I think of all, and there was somebody had a quote today on Twitter, I think it was Jenny Chase at, at, at Bloomberg, uh, New Energy, that it's the best of the worst systems. Uh, uh, all, the other syst all the other systems are even worse, you know, like the democracy quote from uh, Churchill. Um, I think in any case, if you're going to go this route, it needs to be supplemented by organized voluntary products, like day ahead markets or long-term procurement. And there's a big difference between a voluntary product and a mandatory product, like a capacity market. See, in a, in a mandatory product, you don't you don't have any. You can't tell them to go do whatever to themselves to uh, themselves if you don't like what you're doing. You know, if if I, if I'm told, look, either you take on the risk of the high prices if you're short, or or you hedge over there then I'm going to be interested in hedging. I don't want to have to deal with these high prices. I mean, when you're a customer in Texas, for example, 30% of what you pay on your bill is the hedging. You know, if you bought that same power at, the, at market price and just averaged out, uh, you would be paying 30% less on your bill, including all the other net network stuff. So it, it's, a, it's a big deal, the hedging. And um, but it, it, it needs to have this voluntary, I think, element to work properly so that people always have a choice of playing more in the real-time markets if they think that that thing is not delivering. And that kind of keeps the fires under those products to be relevant and adequate. Policymakers and market participants need to move away from deterministic mindset, like, do I have a cap to meet a certain peak? Well, they say, well, I, you know, I'm estimating the peak. There's some statistics there. But OK, it's like one dimension thing. And usually, it's kind of like we're going to take distribution, and then we'll, we'll make sure we'll, we can meet the worst of it. That's not really a risk mitigation management kind of mindset, where you, you're really having to look at a whole bunch of different factors and, and risk weight things. And finally, I think there's a lot of opportunity for better analysis of key parts of the elephant and how the pieces fit together. So for example, in California, they're trying to rejig their flexibility resource adequacy requirement. Um, but they're not really looking at the, at the load, the net load that they're trying to uh, meet 
in a kind of technically sound way. So you, you have all this signal analysis that goes into how to make that MP3 of somebody farting appear on your phone uh, in the minimum amount of time, you know, the hundreds of years of mathematics and so on is, is allowing that to happen. And then meanwhile, people are looking at net load on the system using an Excel spreadsheet and, you know, taking differences of, of the bottom and the top and, uh, you know, not doing any kind of that sophisticated analysis. Okay, well, I think I've reached the limits of your patience. So I'll leave it open for questions and uh, happy to have some discussion. Questions? I've got a warm up question, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, a big part of the discussion here in Australia with resource adequacy is this issue of, well, we want the market to solve it but we need a backstop in case it doesn't. So we need some set of mechanisms by which government can say, mm, no, the market didn't solve it, I've, I've got to step in. The problem then, of course, is it creates a market expectation that the government is backstop. So you get this sort of interplay between these two right. parties. What's the, is this also being seen in the US as a problem, particularly if these hybrid approaches are fuel flagging? And it's a good question. I mean, in to be honest, in a lot of these hybrid approaches, it's not even at that level of bad uh, in the sense that some of these utilities just kind of tell the, the commissions what they think they need and are given a blank check, kind of like the Queensland government with, with the energy system up there. Um, but it's true. Look, if you, if you create a guarantee, you're taking away a risk. The idea of these systems is to put the risk on generators and, and, and buyers to some extent. Uh, so there's, always, there's all, always a problem with creating the backstop. And then the question is, why is the backstop there, right? Well, the idea is that there's this kind of point in the system where that incremental megawatt or whatever that you need it isn't there, and then the whole multi-gigawatt system goes down, right? And then the question is to ask is, is that, does that have to be? Can we segment things more? So if that last megawatt's not there, only a few people are affected, or, 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 or there's a rotation. Can we bring in the demand side? So if that last megawatt's not there, there's always somebody who's willing to kind of turn down what they do. You know, once, once you're outside of that physical uh, breakdown, kind of nonlinear thing th that happens, then I think it's easier to go back and say, hey, maybe we don't need this backstop because it's creating a moral hazard. And people need Either they're going to have to pay big bills because they didn't hedge, or they need to hedge, and the hedging is what's going to finance things. Uh, so that's kind of more my uh, inclination, is we, we have to push policy uh, in that direction, and we have to create a physical engineering environment that mitigates a lot of that risk. And the experience of Texas is you really can go pretty far from what people think of as an ideal state of the system, right? I mean, the problem is if you create a backstop, then where people set the backstop tends to be at this very expensive place. You know, at least a 15% planning reserve margin of some kind and so on. I don't know if that answers your question. You know, we seem to do this class after us, so maybe we can have a few questions outside, if there is. We're pretty much out of time, are we? Yeah, it's two o'clock. Clock, sir. Yeah. Got the wrong clock there. OK. So maybe let's take. Thanks, Eric, again. Well, thank you uh, again. And uh, we'll be having a couple of